<laughs> what advice would you give undergrad students who are interested in your field? And this can also center around the grad school application process. Okay, so definitely first and foremost, like I mentioned, you know, I volunteered at the hospital for three years and that would that really helped me decide like what I wanted to do. <coughs> so definitely do some sort of service work, do some sort of internship. Um, I know for our program, we really look at either if you have internship or work experience. So if you don't have one, you have to have the other. Um, and some programs don't require internships. I don't know like what they're, I believe health science does, but I know some of you guys are from, yeah. might be different majors, I'm not really sure. Um, but my program as an undergrad, the school I went to did not have an internship option. So I didn't even do an internship, but I got involved through something uh, similar that they have here, uh, peer health educators, the, the, what would be similar here would be the fun, like peer, uh, peer health university network. So I got involved in that for three years as well, and that, that helped me decide also I wanted to do public health. Definitely I would say talk in class. I actually, because of all the stuff that I was going through, I was a big agoraphobe, like I could not talk to anybody. Um, anybody would scare me, like I was just in that like bad of a mental state. Um, I couldn't talk to anyone. I still have anxiety, but either way, I always tell myself on the first day, just raise your hand and just talk. Like force yourself, because that usually, if I don't raise my hand on the first day, I'm probably not gonna end up talking that whole like quarter semester. Um, and so that's kind of something that I just tell myself. And go to office hours, try to go to office hours. Um, Sometimes you could just talk about like their research, the professor's research. Um, you don't necessarily need to go in there with the question. Um, it's just sort of for you to build a relationship with that professor. Um, and then eventually they might have like a job opening and then they might end up taking you as a student. Um, and then definitely get involved with any type of opportunities. Um, I remember on the first day of the Masters of Public Health program, they had a, an election for the student representative. I ran and I lost. Mm -hmm. And so, but what ended up happening, the, the chair of the department saw that I was really interested in doing leadership. And so she's like, I see you're really interested and it was unfortunate you, did, you, know, you didn't get it, but would you like to be on the accreditation and assessment committee? And I was like, you know, sure, like, you know, I just want to get, I just want to do something. And so from then on, I, that's where I ended up there and then through getting to know other professors, Dr. Gill, she she asked me to be on the admissions committee, and then from then on, I've been start, I've been on the committee for you know this is my second year, so I've gotten to review lots and lots of applications. Um, but that's kind of how I got there. Like each opportunity like led to another opportunity, and um, I definitely would say apply to every opportunity, especially scholarships. I've gotten so many scholarships already um, from the university. Um, I'm running uh, Sally Casanova. If you're interested in doctoral uh, study, they give me three thousand dollars to like travel to schools, apply to my programs, um, and I I pretty much already use up all that money because it's really expensive to like apply and like travel to schools, um, and then some other grants like Elevan Scholars Graduate Equity Fellowship, and one of them my friend worked in the office, um, and she they were giving out two thousand dollars scholarships. Only a hundred people uh, only a hundred people applied, and they gave out fifty. So I had a 50% chance of getting it, and if, you know, it's just a matter of doing it. A lot of people actually don't do it, so just like actually do it. And then if you don't get it, you don't get it. But if you do, um, you, like you don't know how many people are applying. You could be the only one applying for all you know. So I would just say just do it. Before you, before I move on, um, do you know of specific opportunities for low-income students to fund grad school? Oh, so for the CSU system, it's a little bit easier. Um, but the, for the Cal State Fullerton program, um, as a graduate student, you're automatically declared independent. Um, so it's not based off your parents' income, it's based off your own income. So pr pretty much for most of you guys, that's gonna mean you heck a poor according to the school. Um, and so that's how it was for me. Um, and so because of that, um, well, like I grew up poor, but like I, you know, as each year went by, my parents started earning more income, and then by the time like you know I was about to graduate high school, um, we were declared middle, mid, like middle class, and we I had a high higher EFC, and then so I was like, you know, how am I gonna afford grad school? But then I found out, you know, you're declared independent, so like my income was like zero. I was making, well, I was making eleven thousand, but the I don't know if when you look at when you do the FAFSA, they give you an expected family contribution. It was zero. They expected me to contribute zero to my education because I was an independent and I wasn't making that much money. Um, so because of that, um, the university also has a called something called the state university grant for graduate students. 
and this the state university grant gave me I think like I don't, I don't know it's like seven thousand dollars all you have it pretty much pays your tuition you just have to pay the fees so like three hundred four hundred dollars a semester so it's all I'm paying for um, graduate school here um, and so that's pretty much like nothing like I know other people that are like in a lot of debt um, because it chose something else I probably could have chosen something else but that's kind of I also I already had debt as an undergrad not that much it was only like ten thousand um, but this allowed me to like also pay off those loans which I already have um, pay off those loans and you know just finish my studies and not worry about it and I'm like I'll worry about it once I get into doctoral programs but usually if your expected family contribution is less than five thousand they usually give you the grant and let's say um, you are going into a grad school program um, and they don't give you the best offer based on maybe you are making a decent amount of money um, right now you can file a hardship affidavit with the financial aid office and that'll reevaluate the your situation currently even right now for some reason your income changes your parents income changes um, and they need it's a lot lower than what it was you can file that hardship affidavit with the financial aid office and they'll review your case based on your current parents income or your current income and they'll give you a better financial aid package um, and I've learned that through attending workshops. So that's something else I did. I've, I've attended different workshops because I wanted to learn more. Um, so that's just like a little bit of information that I've learned from attending other various workshops. I'm like, wow, this is like super helpful. And um, it's helped me a lot um, throughout this, like my educational career. Yeah. Yeah, Hope you all wrote that down now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got that grant too, because I had zero going into grad school. Um, so yeah, that's super helpful, and that's something to look forward to, hopefully. Um, advice that I would give, um, don't feel that it's all about GPA. That's great and everything, but I can tell you right now that I, I didn't have a 4.0, and um, I got in, so it's possible. And um, advice that I would give is to be well-rounded, as well-rounded as you can be, like um, volunteer, in places or work in places that are kind of relevant to your career path. Um, for example, like the speech clinic where I volunteered, that's what I chose. And then APA was also kind of related because autism is a huge, a huge uh, thing nowadays. And so you're, you're bound to see that if you do go into the pediatric population. Um, and also, like Nancy said, speak to your professors and get to know them. <coughs> offer to you know help them with their research or something like that just be remembered make them remember you because they're more likely to say yes to someone that they remember than to someone who they barely know and also your letter will be more relevant once they it comes time for them to write your letter of rec they'll be able to put more personal things down because it's it's easy to see when a letter is more personal than when it's kind of oh, I kind of barely know this person general so you want to be remembered that doesn't help you if you have a letter of recommendation that doesn't sound like it's specific to you it actually kind of hurts you um. <laughs> <laughs> one of the one of the people who wrote my letter spelled my name wrong oh no and I realized that after I was like oh gosh they're gonna think she has no idea who I am so that was really bad make sure they spell your name right <laughs> at least you got to know <laughs> <laughs> advice I would give um, put yourself out there like they were saying volunteer do a lot of that stuff and even if that experience points you to the direction like oh no I don't want to do that it's still good experience you know so it'll everything just think everything that you do everything that you choose to do from here on out is going to put you on that path to that goal of where you want to be whether it's steering you um, to the direction of yes that's exactly where I want to be or uh uh not not me not happening but every little bit helps and every little bit counts so to be put yourself um, out there and take those risks you learn from your mistakes don't be afraid to fail all those failures will accumulate to something to a big success because if you stay stagnant and you, you don't really put yourself out there you don't take those risks you won't really know, you won't really have any idea. And even if you get to the end of the light, <laughs> the end of that tunnel, you kind of won't really know exactly what to do, you know. Um, another thing is uh, 
those volunteer experiences, those internships that you take, be more focused on the interaction with the people, the clients, the patients, your higher ups, your the people that are below you. Have start developing that good relationship with everyone you encounter because because in healthcare, it's a people skill related uh, field. Like you have to speak with people. You're going to speak with family, caregivers, patients, clients, um, coworkers, bosses. You're going to need to know how to conduct yourself in the professional setting so that you give off that kind of um, that vibe that you know you're really there to be there to help because that's why we're all here. I mean, you guys want to help people, so make sure you kind of practice those skills and tailor those skills, those communication skills, your body language, how you walk into the room, how you address a client, how you address your peer, your colleague, or how you write an email. All that stuff is really important. And um, when you put yourself out there with these internships and, and talking with your professors and reaching out to see if you can help with the research, all that is really great practice for when you're actually in the field working with researchers, in the field working with patients and all that stuff. So every little bit counts and just think that every move you make from here on out will kind of will determine where you are in the future. So make the right choices and even if you don't make the right choices, those failures will help too. Can I stuff on applications then? Sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so um I was just thinking about personal statements. So I've seen a lot of personal statements. Um, I definitely, among the worst I've seen is stuff that's like, definitely like they said, make yourself memorable. Um, something I've seen like as a first sentence, like I went to UC Irvine and graduated with a bachelor's and blah, blah, blah. As a first sentence, I'm like, okay, like I see that on your resume. Like, why would you include that in your personal statement as your first sentence? It just wasted space. Yeah, it's just wasted <laughs> space because you already have a limited work count already to begin with. I know for our program it's pretty small. Um, I'm like, why would you even you know use up that space when you could put something else? So definitely like make sure it stands out. Um, possibly attend a writing workshop of some personal statement um, type of workshop. Um, and definitely I would say um, another mistake I've seen is where people put like every problem they've gone through. Um, which it, you know, some problems, yes, they've made you stronger. Um, I mentioned a lot of things, I, you know, that I've gone through, but I would say pretty much pick one that influenced you, just so you don't overwhelm them. Because if not, like, if there were, to, if I were to just like drop everything, like my whole, like everything I've been through, all the struggles I faced into like one little, like one um, piece of thing, I'm like, it, I think they'd be overwhelmed. Like, I don't know if you, I want to accept this person. That might be a little crazy. Um, <laughs> So like probably pick one, like something that really influenced you the most or that's most related to your ultimate career goal. Um, but definitely along those points, um, my friend went the opposite way. She's always the one not to really mention um, what has happened. And she, her grade suffered as a result of her having a tumor. And her first time she applied to a program, she didn't include that. Like um, why her grade suffered? Because she had a tumor. She didn't feel it was relevant. She's like, I don't feel like they want to know I'm a girl. I'm about to, like, you know, if I was your mom, I would give you a chanclazo, which is like, I would get you with, like, a sandal. Because you have to include that. Like, if it's something that's relevant, like, what happened? Why did your grades drop? Because they are able to tell, like, if we look through your transcript, because we get all of your transcripts. Um, we look and find patterns. Um, so sometimes, if it's this pattern, that is a concern, meaning you had high grades, low grades, just, like, throughout. Um, that is kind of a concern, but let's say um, you had A's. First semester, second semester, like, you know, they start dropping down, like, you know, we want to know what happened, what during that time happened that, like, maybe affected your grades and is not reflective of your full potential. So I would definitely say that's something else. And in terms of letters of recommendation, um, professors are very, very honest. I'm surprised. Like, I'm just like, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Like, I hope mine are, like, okay. Like, I know they like me, uh, but, you know, I'm not sure. Um, but I'd say I've definitely made the best um, or as much effort as it could possibly do, but if you got an A and you didn't speak at all in their class, like we've seen letters that are like, you know, this person got an A, but I don't know the student, and it's like two, like three sentences, and I'm like, that's not a very good letter of recommendation. Um, but you know, even if you don't think, I would say like try to do it now. But I know as an undergrad, one of the classes I didn't speak as much. Um, but you know, I went in there and um, I met with them for like at least an hour and I explained to them like what happened during this time, what I've been doing because I took a year off. 
um, and why I found that.